Good morning, saints. It's good to be with you today as we enter into the Lord's Word. It's going to be Isaiah chapter 45, which was our Old Testament lesson this past Sunday. Uh, Didn't have opportunity to enter into it. We focused instead upon uh, the Lord as our friend. He has made us uh, friends instead of servants. And if you didn't catch that Sunday, uh, that's online uh, as well in the sermon for this past Sunday. Um, But this great passage in Isaiah 45, uh, um, just really um, touches us in terms of the Lord's sovereignty. It should give us a sense of hope and security. Uh, and uh, I want to enter into that with you by first setting the context uh, for this passage. Uh, you need to remember, one, that Isaiah wrote <clears throat> in the early 700s B.C. Um, in fact, in the early part of Isaiah, he foretells the coming invasion uh, and destruction of the northern tribes by Assyria. And that took place, we know, in 722 B.C. So he's writing before then, and he's foretelling that. What's really fascinating is that then he goes on and foretells another uh, destruction, and that will be upon Judah. And that happened, um, you know, almost 200 years, not quite 200 years uh, after uh, Isaiah prophesied. And so he tells of this coming uh, uh, exile for uh, Judah, but he also then tells of their coming deliverance. Um, And so uh, a a real, and he does this regularly, you you know, he he lays it out, uh, the discipline that's coming, and yet then he gives us the hope. uh, It's, you know, of the final word really is the hope that we have in God. And for those who are in exile, um, they should have read back to uh, Isaiah uh, and seen this word, this promise of the the coming uh, deliverer, an anointed one. It's actually the same word as Messiah. So he he is a type, if you will, of the Messiah. He's not the Messiah, but he's a type uh, in that he delivers uh, the Lord's people. Of course, we know that Jesus, Yeshua, is uh, the Mashiach, the the anointed one, the Messiah, uh, and he's the Messiah for Israel, for us, indeed for the world. Um, and so uh, the Lord is raising up a type of that who's going to uh, rescue his people. I just think it's really something how he uh, announces this 200 years before he raises up uh, his servant Cyrus. This is how it reads. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, that gates may not be closed. Then the Lord is addressing Cyrus. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. Could you imagine being Cyrus and hearing this? Because that's likely what happened, is a couple hundred years later, uh, Daniel, who was still living at the time of Cyrus, uh, likely is the one who delivered the message to Cyrus that he was called by God to deliver uh, Israel. In fact, Ezra records this. Back in Ezra uh, chapter 1, we have the proclamation of Cyrus. And it says this, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Of course, Jeremiah had prophesied that the exiles would be uh, uh, 70 years uh, before uh, they'd be able to come back. And so that's uh, a reference uh, there that, Uh, Ezra's making. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. (laughs) So phenomenal. So Ezra's recording uh, that this was the proclamation that Cyrus made. Uh, um, a response, really, to God's command. And, of course, he speaks of God here. Um, 
And the Lord was revealing himself, uh, according to Isaiah, that Cyrus would know that the Lord is the only Lord. Um, and we're told in verse 13 of Isaiah 45 that I have stirred him up in righteousness. And those are the very words that um, Ezra uses is that the Lord stirred up um, Cyrus. He was stirred up to do God's bidding. And what was that bidding? Uh, the Lord goes on to say in verse 13, and I will make all his ways level, talking about Cyrus. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. So he's doing it because the Lord uh, had called him to do it. Uh, an amazing representation of the Lord's sovereignty. Uh, he knows the beginning from the end, and the end from the beginning. Um, that's explicitly what he says over and over. There is no God like me, he says. Uh, there is none who can uh, foretell the future like God does. And so he's called forth this servant. That's the other thing we're reminded of. And it's very important for us is that the nations, um, they rise and fall according to God's purposes. And we don't see those purposes, uh, but he's involved. And so when uh, presidents come and go, when world rulers come and go, uh, when nations come and go, uh, the Lord is sovereign over that. Uh, that should give us a lot of hope. Um, we do know that the world is wicked and so that all the things that happen are not good, but the Lord can take those and work them to ultimate good, to his ultimate purposes. Uh, and it's important for us to know his word so we know ahead of time, really, uh, and we, we've got a good idea about the ebb and flow of history just from uh, what God's word tells us about uh, the world and humanity. Um, all right, so he's the sovereign one, and he he um, exhorts us to ask him. So in verse 11, he speaks of, uh, ask me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? So often people have this attitude of approaching the Lord to tell him what to do uh, as if he doesn't know what to do. <laughs> he knows. Uh, and he's the one that brings forth uh, uh, the things that really serve to our good. Um, so we're to ask him to do that and ask in his name. And of course, that's what Jesus calls us to do uh, in the gospels as well, that we who are entered into relationship with him, uh, who keep his commands, who love him and abide in his love, that we can uh, ask him uh, anything. Um, and so we have that same encouragement uh, from the Lord here. Uh, and we can ask it with confidence because he is sovereign and he's the creator. And so verse 12, I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens and I commanded all their host. Um, the Bible over and over again emphasizes God as creator. So this uh, theory in the world uh, that is promoted as fact today that somehow we showed up accidentally uh, and evolved. Um, and of course, now more you're hearing um, from scientists that no, uh, life was planted here from somewhere else in the universe and then evolved. Uh, both of those are in error. Uh, the Bible insists that God is the creator, and he's the creator of man, and he's creator of the heavens and the earth. And in fact, we, we hear something here. I mean, here's Isaiah writing in 700 uh, plus BC, and he speaks of stretching out the heavens. He says this a number of times. In, you know, the Lord is enthroned over the circle of the earth, and he stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Well, physicists tell us that that's how uh, the the universe has been expanding, is like a, a curtain. Um, well, how did Isaiah know that in 740 you know, BC? Uh, he knew it because God, who knows all things, uh, revealed it to him. Um, and so that's the God that we go to in prayer. And that's the God in which we have our hope. That's the God that the exiles of Israel to have hope in. And so down at verse 17, but Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God. 
who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. So we have here an emphasis again on his creative power and then saying to Israel, um, I'm the one who saves you. Uh, what a word of hope that in the midst of uh, words of judgment that the Lord is saying, uh, you know, basically as it says in the New Testament, the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. And those who are called by him, uh, he, he keeps them for himself. But that doesn't mean we don't undergo discipline uh, to shape us and to call us back to himself. And uh, yet our salvation is secure with him. And that's the promise to Israel. That's the promise to you and me as followers of, of Jesus. Um, and there is no other uh, savior. So the Lord goes on to say this in verse 20. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. It reminds me there of the dependence that the world has on um, pagan leaders. I mean, let's think about it. Is our hope in some, um, you know, new president? Is our hope in some uh, new leader of uh, the United Nations? Is our hope in uh, some other nation rising up? If they don't have the Lord, then they're idolatrous. And so, you know, he speaks here of the wooden idols, but, but that's really what that's representing is putting their hope in anything uh, that is really less than themselves, actually. I mean, a wooden idol, uh, you know, it's like the Lord, this is Chuck's paraphrase of him. He says, give me a break, you guys. You know, you formed the, those with your, you didn't create them, uh, but they were already there and you formed it with your own hand. You're creating this idol. Uh, how silly is that? Uh, and the same message is how silly is it to put our hope in uh, fallen leaders who aren't dependent upon the Lord. Um, they are like blind men walking through the world. And so it's distressing when Christians think that somehow we're going to set up the kingdom on earth by uh, getting the right people in office. Uh, not so. Um, we need to be dependent upon the Lord, and those leaders need to be dependent upon the Lord. It's not any theories or philosophies that we have. Uh, it's um, that there is no other God besides me. The Lord says, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. The only one ultimately to save us uh, is the Lord. And so he calls people to turn to him and be saved. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn. From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear allegiance. So now the appeal is not just to Israel. The appeal isn't just to you and uh, me as those who have come to Jesus. The appeal is to the whole world. And of course, that's part of then our mission as the church is to take that appeal to the world, uh, that the world may know that he's the Lord and that they may turn to him and be saved because they're not gonna find salvation in anything else. The great reset, uh, providing a one world government, that's gonna do just the opposite of what they want. The only way that the world will have peace uh, will be under uh, the Lord's sovereign rule. And so they need to turn to him and uh, we as the church need to get that message out. Furthermore, uh, this is an oath that God made, as I love this, by myself I have sworn. You know, when you, I mean, I learned not to do, do this, but you know, when I was younger, hearing kids say, I swear to, right? Well, they swear to God? Yeah, well, but why? Because he's the highest power and witness. Uh, well, what's higher than God? Nothing. And so who's he to swear by? So I've sworn by myself, he says. Uh, and he cannot lie, we're told in Scripture. Um, and so he's saying, this is certain. As you hear this word from me, count on it. In fact, what is the end result is going to be every knee shall bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. That reminds me of uh, St. Paul's letter to the Philippians where he tells them and us 
Therefore, God has ex highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, we have this equation of Jesus with the Lord God, the Lord to whom every knee will bow uh, is one and the same with our Lord Jesus. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the three uh, persons in one being, and uh, all of us will bow the knee to, to them. The question is re really whether all will be willing or not, but, but we will do it, and I'm doing so with uh, great uh, gladness. I'm looking forward to that day to bow the knee, and my lifestyle should be that even now, as I pray that yours is. Uh, so it's our Lord Jesus who's uh, one and the same there. And so when the Lord says here that uh, he's uh, the righteous God and a Savior, there is none besides me, that's talking about our Lord as well, the Lord who came into the world to die for us. St. Peter said it this way in Acts 4, verse 12, and there is no, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Same point. Uh, the Lord is the Savior, and there is no other. So all the religions of the world count as nothing. There may be truths in them. Uh, there certainly must be. Uh, but you know, there was truth in what Satan said too to Eve to deceive her. Uh, the trick is adding deception along with the truth. Um, and that's the way uh, the greatest deceptions take place, is the grain of truth added with uh, deception. Uh, if we want to rely on any word, it's the Lord's. Again, that's why here at COK we emphasize uh, learning the word of God as revealed in the Bible. Uh, so that we hear that word, we respond to that word, we have confidence in that word, and we have hope then uh, because he is our hope. Uh, and he knows that beginning from the end, and he said, I am your Savior. There isn't any other, and in me you'll be secure. And that's how he ends this passage with uh, Israel, saying in verse 25, In the Lord all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. Uh, the promise that we see revealed in Scripture is that Israel herself, though she has been separated from God uh, for some time, she's been alienated from Him. He will restore her. She will, in the end, uh, be justified, her sin paid for, and show glory. Uh, so uh, Israel, so also you and I, as we hold on to our hope in Him, we shall glory with Him who has justified us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, saints, for being with me, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his shalom now and evermore. Amen.